Hi, what? Welcome to Fossil's Biotech and Health Extension Salon Series, sponsored by 100 Plus Capital. I'm really, really happy to have so many of you here and still lots more joining. Um, today we have Reason, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, I think Reason was the one really like the gateway drug for me into uh, longevity. I read Fight Aging um, and it's just really succinctly written articles uh, about longevity and about like various different arguments that you usually come across for why it's really not something we should aspire to and then like really good rebuttals and uh, I think it's just a really succinctly well-written blog. Obviously you also have a company uh, which I think we'll be hearing perhaps a little bit more about today and you're also leading Foresight's uh, personal patrol longevity group uh, which is more about personal longevity uh, for our long-term supporters. Uh, so thank you so so much for joining. I do want to before we hit the road here remind folks that if you are want to join us in person again this year we have our longevity workshop that's coming up on april 17 to 18 from 9 a.m to 5 p.m each of these days we already have lots of folks that are speaking and, and attending you can pretty much take a little uh, peruse already um through the website and it would be really wonderful to see many of you here so we already have a bit of a format there but like Last year, I think, was really great uh, to see so many of you that we often see virtually uh, in person. So I'm going to post it here in the chat. It's also on our website. Um, and yeah, I'll be in the chat from now on. I'm also going to post the nomination sheet for future presentations. But for now, I'm very happy to welcome Reason. And let's see if the uh, slight hubris will catch you or if you'll manage. Yes, let's see if I escape once again to live another day. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see a, um, a desktop here and um, hopefully you can see a full body set of slides also, um, which I will, I will get going. So today, um, the topic of discussion is uh, biotechnology to finally defeat cholesterol. Um, this is, this is um, something that's long been an interest of mine. Um, my company, Repair, co-founded with Bill Sherman, um, is really dedicated to trying to deal with this, this issue. Now, you might think, well, we already know everything about cholesterol. Don't we focus obsessively about this? And quite possibly, yes, the world is obsessively focused on cholesterol, but not in the right way, um, as, will, as will become apparent as I walk through some of this. And uh, it's a little less of a focus on us and more of a focus on on the question of cholesterol, of course, because I have a company, um, one has to sort of say these things um, just in case any of you are an investment bank in disguise. Otherwise, just consider it an EULA for this, this discussion. So you might well ask yourself, wait, why does, why does cholesterol need to be defeated? Um, isn't it good? Isn't it necessary? Isn't it everywhere? Um, and the answer is yes, it is, it is necessary in vital indeed, and it is everywhere in your body because it is a component of cell membranes and not to mention that cholesterol is also a precursor for a bunch of things that are actually rather essential to life, like steroid hormones, bile acid, and vitamin D. So unfortunately, and the story would be very different if this was the case, cholesterol is not locally manufactured and destroyed. Um, in the body, unlike many of the molecules that we need for daily life, cholesterol is really expensive to manufacture energetically. So it's manufactured in specialized locations, primarily the liver. And then because it's manufactured in one place and needed everywhere, you have this incredible Rube Goldberg system of particles that carry cholesterol around and cell receptors and cell behaviors to try to shuffle the cholesterol to where it's needed and a bunch of weird feedback signals that are only partially understood to, to try to get the system to come into homeostasis. And of course, any complicated system like this is, is a prime candidate for falling over horribly as we age. And of course, this system falls over horribly as we age. Um, there are other ways to get it to fall over horribly as well, and we will touch on some of those. But primarily, and very overly simplistically, you might think of this as a system where the liver creates stuff, shoves it out into the bloodstream for transport into the body. Some of it ends up in blood vessel walls, too much of it, where it's picked up by macrophage cells and then handed back to the bloodstream to go on a different set of particles, because, you know, why does everything have to be non-complicated in the body? A different set of particles for coming back to the liver, where it's um, reprocessed or excreted. And 
parts of the system fall down very badly as we age. The other way, of course, to get the system to fall down really horribly is become fat. Um, just eat a lot of cholesterol, like a lot of cholesterol, become obese. This really messes up the system. So we actually really have two, um, two paths here when one's talking about cholesterol and getting too much of it. There's the more age-related path, which leads to localized excesses of cholesterol in the vasculature, and that produces atherosclerosis, um, which is not an insignificant cause of human mortality. But then there's the other path where you put on an enormous amount of weight and just package your body full of cholesterol to the point where there's just nowhere left to store it. Um, and that leads you to non-alcoholic um, fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis that follows from fatty liver disease, which is a really obnoxious condition, uh, arguably more preventable. These are two very different, two very different paths, but the underlying cause of pathology is exactly the same, that you happen to have too much cholesterol in one location, and that leads to cell, cell pathology and cell death. So. Obviously, there's a lot of effort to keep homeostasis, homeostasis going on in such a complicated system of make somewhere, deliver everywhere, and then deliver back to the place you made it if you have too much of it. Um, it's, it's like a giant shopping network. Um, so cells are capable to a certain degree of taking too much cholesterol and stashing it. So they, they, stuff, they turn it into a cholesterol, a cholesterol ester and store it in lipid droplets. Um, there's also a very complicated set of signals uh, and behavior of organs that goes on throughout the body to try to, to dampen uptake or dampen biosynthesis of cholesterol or make more of it or excrete more of it. Um, uh, unfortunately, both of these systems are easy to overwhelm. Uh, they're very easy to overwhelm. You can do it just by eating too much. You can do it just by getting old. Um, and the, the consequence of that is... Uh, you get this horrible situation of, of atherosclerosis, NASH, and actually I'll give you a nice long laundry list of other problems as well. Um, so coming back to the two, the two ideas here. So you have um, at the top here, non-alcoholic hepatitis. Now, in order to get the excess cholesterol in the liver that you need for this to happen, you really just have to fill your body with cholesterol. Um, you have to become so fat and so, um, so have so many lipids in your body that you just completely run out of places to put it. This is also how you get type 2 diabetes, by the way. You, you run out of places to put fat, and then the pancreas starts to get overloaded with excess fat. Um, but in order to get that gram or two of pathological fat into the pancreas, you literally have to have hundreds of pounds of the stuff um, elsewhere in the body to overwhelm all of the storage depots. So this is, this is really a, a very different mechanism from atherosclerosis and familial hypercholesterolemia, where what is going on is really that your macrophage cells become impacted by aging to the point at which they can't, um, they can't effectively scavenge the misplaced cholesterol. The, the way to think about these diseases is really that there's a tipping point at which cholesterol in the blood vessel walls overwhelms the local capacity to get rid of the cholesterol in the blood vessel walls and send it back into the bloodstream. And where that tipping point is, is a function of your age. It's a function of how much cholesterol you have in your bloodstream. Um, and it's a function of other things such as inflammation, um, genetic mutations, and so on and so forth. So different people have different tipping points. Um, but at the point at which you reach that tipping point, then you start to get lesions growing and they become self-sustaining and it stops mattering how much cholesterol you have in your bloodstream because it becomes a feedback loop in which macrophages become overwhelmed and attract more macrophages to add to the, add to the plaque volume. And eventually it kills you. Um, you'll be hearing that a lot. So the, the, the way in which NASH progresses, it's really just a case of look at all this cholesterol um, and it just it just overwhelms a certain set of cells, um, and the important ones are those associated with um, with with the, the maintenance of the extracellular matrix um, and the management of inflammation. So you get this sort of feedback loop of inflammation, um, problems in the maintenance of tissue that lead to an excess deposition of, of collagen, 
and that leads you to fibrosis. And the core of NASH, if, if NASH did not have fibrosis, then you could just, quote unquote, just lose weight and it, everything would be fine. It's like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is pre-fibrosis. If you lose weight, you're good. Um, but in this case, once you have the fibrosis, you're stuck. That's it. That's permanent. There's no way to reverse it right now. Um, except, of course, we have a way to reverse it. That's why we're talking. So in the normal state of things, this is why NASH is such a hot topic. It affects such a large percentage of the population right now. Something like 8% of the U.S. population has NASH. Um, it's 30% are obese. 20% of obese people have NASH. It's, it's a very prevalent condition and entirely self-inflicted. It doesn't make it any easier on the people who have it, of course. So atherosclerosis, on the other hand, is a different sort of a progression where you get this, this problems in the endothelium in the, um, in the blood vessel walls um, tend to aggravate the process of misplaced um, and oxidized LDL cholesterol carriers. And the macrophages come in and deal with this. Uh, and they deal with this up until the point at which it becomes overwhelming. Uh, and they become foam cells. They get stuck with all this cholesterol they can't deal with. And at which point, the thing turns into a feedback loop where they're going to attract more monocytes. They're going to start to affect surrounding cell populations. And it becomes a big, horrible fibrous plaque mess on the right there. And that goes downhill and then you die. So um, it's, it's no fun. But these are very different. You, you can see that these are, these are very different conditions um, between the two things. But at the core, the problem is the excess cholesterol. If you did not have that, things would look a lot, a lot better. So the real issue beyond the fact, you know, these things are terrible, the real issue is that they're currently largely irreversible. So you get what you get in the course of having developed the disease. And if halfway through you decide, I don't want to deal with this, and you start to do everything right, and you take all the drugs that you can take that are on offer for these conditions, and you fix your lifestyle, and you get thin, and you stop eating fatty foods, and um, do everything you can do that people tell you to do, you're stuck. Um, you aren't going to radically reverse either the atherosclerotic lesions or the fibrosis. Um, and the treatments for um, cholesterol, like the high cholesterol in the bloodstream, don't reverse the plaque you have, and it's the plaque that kills you. And in the case of fibrosis, you know, there's nothing you can do right now to reverse that, that fibrosis in your, um, in your liver and the loss of liver function. So these are enormous unmet needs, and the existing standard of care is either non-existent in the case of NASH or, or you know, just not doing a good enough job in the case of atherosclerosis. It's a big problem. As you can see, this is all down to cholesterol. Cholesterol is, is an enormous villain in, um, in the matter of, of broad health across the population. And as a sidebar, don't be obese because I'm picking out Nash here as, as obviously the thing you chase because it's a really hot topic. But almost everything else that, that goes on in, in a, as, as a major issue in aging is probably affected by the excess cholesterol accumulation that occurs when you're overweight, if you become seriously obese. Um, they're all um, very very unpleasantly affected by these, this mechanism of just having too much free cholesterol, which makes cells pathological, inflammatory, dead, or um, changes their behavior in pathological ways. Atherosclerosis is probably one of the few of these where, you know, you have this weird localized behavior where it's still about excess cholesterol. You're much better off if you're not obese. So I didn't need to tell you all this, I'm sure, but don't be obese. So here's a good question. If, if cholesterol is the problem, and we've known that cholesterol was the problem for a long time, and we have, why didn't we just get rid of it? Um, and the problem here is that it is everywhere. Um, you can't just get rid of it, or at least you can't just get rid of it using the tools of uh, medical science that have existed to date, which means small molecules. So you can't just send a small molecule into the body to try to hey, let's go soak up the cholesterol. There are a class of small molecules that will just soak up cholesterol. They're called cyclodextrins. And if you put enough cyclodextrins into a human to 
take the cholesterol out of their atherosclerotic plaques, you turn their blood to mush um, because it would suck all the cholesterol out of cells as well. Small molecules are, are not very directed. They always go do their thing, uh, grab whatever, grab whatever cholesterol they can grab. So it's a problem, um, which means people have focused on very indirect ways to try to reduce cholesterol. And indirect means largely inefficient and low degrees of efficacy. And that has been the case in atherosclerosis and attempts to treat NASH. So um, we, of course, can do better than this, which is why we're talking. So let's see now. Um, next slide. So let's argue with myself. Um, why isn't the use of statins to reduce cholesterol synthesis or, 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 LD, or um, enhance cholesterol uptake or, and thereby reduce LDL cholesterol in the bloodstream. Why isn't this, why isn't this addressing cholesterol directly? Isn't this addressing cholesterol directly? The answer is no, it really isn't. Um, because if you look at the atherosclerosis situation, um, the LDL cholesterol is really just about one, it's, it's one factor in the tipping point at which your, your issue in blood vessel walls, your localized little point of too much cholesterol starts to become self-sustaining and turn into a plaque. It's just one, the LDL cholesterol in your bloodstream, how much you have of that is just one factor. It's an important factor if you're a mutant who has 10 times the normal um, LDL cholesterol, but it's just one factor. So we we know what we can do by radically lowering LDL cholesterol because we have drugs that can do that. And those drugs are in widespread use. They don't radically reverse the plaque. You can't suck the cholesterol out of a plaque with LDL with, with statins or similar technologies. You, you can't get reversal. It's not a direct effect. You're, you're tinkering the system and you're not tinkering the right part of the system. So Nash, you can make similar arguments. Statins are tinkering the system but uh, in order to obtain indirect benefits, but they're not large indirect benefits and they're not, they're, they're not doing enough good to be meaningful therapies. Of course, people tried. Statins are enormously widely used. So there's an immense amount of data to say what happens when obese people take statins. And the answer is not as much, not as much good as we'd like. It's unfortunate. So further arguments. Wait, I said about, I said, small molecules can't do this. What about what about upregulation of reverse cholesterol transport? That half of the picture where you're taking cholesterol from the blood vessel walls and sending it back to the liver via HDL particles. And, you know, there's all sorts of ways you can actually upregulate this transport. Generally speaking, you're looking at upregulating the genes involved. You get an increased expression of, let's say, the macrophage genes that are involved in giving cholesterol to the HDL particles and, and their ABCA1 and ABCG1. And weirdly, um, the way it works is ABCA1 gives the first cholesterol molecule to a empty um, HDL particle, and then it adds more via ABCG1. But um, all of these things work great. I mean, in mice, you can, you can reverse atherosclerosis by 50%. Um, by upregulating reverse cholesterol transport. In humans, everything that's been trialed, it, trialed in, in clinical trials has failed miserably. There's something we really don't understand about, about the rate-limiting processes here. Um, and once you have you know, macrophage cells being completely overwhelmed by cholesterol and becoming foam cells, they're not engaging in reverse cholesterol transport anymore. They've been taken out of the picture and turned into part of the problem. So this is a system, this, this is a great idea. It just doesn't work. Um, so of course, since I'm sitting here saying small molecules don't work, we kind of have to talk about cyclarity. This is formerly underdog, um, renamed, because they use a cyclodextrin approach. What they're doing, because you can't just shove enough cyclodextrins into a person to get rid of all the cholesterol you want to get rid of without killing them, um, cyclo, you can, what you can do is, is tinker a cyclodextrin that binds only a toxic altered form of cholesterol. Now, seven keto cholesterol is worse than normal cholesterol, um, when it comes to harming cells and making them stop doing their job in the blood vessel walls. So it probably has an outsized influence over normal cholesterol. Unfortunately, we can't really answer how good this is going to be in animal models. So Cyclarity are doing the fast path and they're rolling right into human trials on the basis essentially of tissue models and in vitro evidence of safety. 
which is really great. I mean, if everybody could do that, that would be amazing. Science would go really fast. Um, the trouble here is that their approach can't touch the excess unmodified cholesterol. And we know that excess unmodified cholesterol is a problem. It causes pathology. So it's hopefully cyclarity moves the tipping point. Um, but I think we still need technologies such as, um, such as the one I'm going to tell you about, which get rid of the unmodified excess cholesterol in addition to the, um, the oxidized and other altered forms of cholesterol that are perhaps somewhat more toxic to the cells that they are, they are around. So what do we do at Repair Biotechnologies? So what we have is a set of proteins um, that exist in the human body are not normally present doing their thing in the same place at the same time. But if you combine them together, you get something that can break down only excess intracellular cholesterol. Um, and it breaks it down into a harmless product that, that heads out of the body and is quickly removed. So you essentially, you can give cells the ability to be a cholesterol sink. They'll just eat cholesterol um, and get rid of it. So we have an optimized repair fusion protein, and there's some additional options for helper proteins that can speed up the funneling of cholesterol to the fusion protein. And if you're really interested in this, I mean, take a look at our, take a look at the original paper published by the research team that produced this, this technology that we took and then have later refined and improved upon considerably. And, you know, take a look at the patent that resulted from that. It's, it's complicated stuff and not all of it is relevant to what we do exactly, but it's very interesting, the biochemistry that goes into how you actually do this. In terms of getting this into the body, you can pretty much use anything um, in principle. In practice, of course, you're a little more constrained than everything, um, regulators being what they are, but any gene therapy tool will work um, to get this into cells and actually doing its, doing its job. And you've probably seen this data, folks who've been following us for a while. Um, if you, as an example of how this works, you can take macrophage cells, mouse macrophage lines here, and um, give, give them excess cholesterol. You take MBD cholesterol is fluorescently labeled, so that's why it's glowing. On the left are macrophages that have not been equipped with our fusion protein, and they're dying. Um, they've been given cholesterol and they're not happy. They're becoming foam cells. They're falling apart. Um, on the right, the, uh, the cells that have our protein have eaten the cholesterol. They're perfectly happy. So that's really what we want to do in, in people's livers and arteries is, uh, is ensure that cells stop being completely destroyed by excesses of free cholesterol. And it works really well. Um, it's very safe. So our present approach... Sure is really just delivering um, genes with lipid nanoparticles in mRNA. Uh, this, has been, this has been the most small molecule-like of all gene therapies, and perhaps that's why it's, it's seen such a, um, a wide adoption, because it isn't, it isn't quite as threatening as the more permanent gene therapies. You put, you put a lipid, an LNP mRNA therapy into a body, it lasts for a couple of days. Um, it's very small molecule-like in that, in that respect. So the, the, the industries that work separately on mRNA and lipid nanoparticles are well-established. They've been around for like quite a long time, uh, but especially with the, um, the recent vaccines for COVID, they've now become a lot more accepted and they've received a lot more expansion and funding. So one can go out there and find any number of manufacturers and um, people with established lipid nanoparticles that have proven in the clinic um, are, are not. They're not common, but there's a number of them. So one can go out there and say, hey, guys, give me your, give me your liver-targeted lipid nanoparticle that's been through the clinic and the FDA says is great. And they'll say, sure, um, sign a deal, and here we go. It's a little harder if you want to target something other than the liver um, because most gene therapies go to the liver if you inject them intravenously. So most of the experience in the community and most of the drugs are liver-targeted. You need to do some more work if you want to go somewhere other than the liver, but this is a, generally it's a good path. This is a community that's very, that's thinking very strongly about how do we do safe long-term repeat dosing of a gene therapy in a way that's very analogous to small molecules in cost and, um, and, and results, except of course, because it's a gene therapy, it's immediately better than a small molecule for manipulating a particular um, gene 
or regulatory pathway because you're, you're directly affecting it rather than trying to have some sort of indirect small molecule approach with, um, with horrible side effects usually. So what can we do? We think that this recent data is actually, is actually one of the more impressive demonstrations that gets to the point of it. Um, if you look on the right, this is, this is days past injection of a single dose of the lipid nanoparticle mRNA in a bunch of fat mice. These are, these are obese mice with NASH. So what you can see is that the free cholesterol immediately just goes down and then bounces back up again as the, as the, um, because these mice are still eating the high fat diet, they're loading on the cholesterol. The, the drug outpaces the cholesterol, the free cholesterol excess for a while there, and then it stops. So this is a drug that you want to keep dosing. But if you look on the left, you immediately see that the ALT, AST enzymes, which are a measure of liver pathology, because these enzymes are released from stressed and dying cells, um, immediately goes, goes down. It drops radically. And this is exactly what you want to see if you're treating a liver condition. You want to see that, that immediately you've hit, the, um, you've hit the important mechanism that's causing the problem. And in this case, the important mechanism is clearly the excess free cholesterol because our drug doesn't do anything except get rid of the excess free cholesterol. It's, it's great. So we know exactly that the free cholesterol is causing this, this liver cell death and stress that's, that leads to the high, high ALT, AST that is one of the hallmarks of, um, of liver disease. Um, so now, more, perhaps more interestingly from a scientific perspective, if you just do this, if you only remove the excess cholesterol, free cholesterol from the liver, suddenly your glucose tolerance improves, your insulin metabolism improves. Now, insulin metabolism and glucose tolerance are very high level. These are high level systemic functions. And to see an improvement, a marked significant improvement of this magnitude, um, when all you've done is removed excess free cholesterol, it's a very compelling argument as to the that, that the excess free cholesterol is the significant pathological mechanism in this condition. And of course, by analogy to this, we can say, okay, this is going on in your liver, but now think about what's going on in your blood vessels with the, with the, you know, the, um, the plaque that is basically a huge lump of cholesterol. It's doing the same thing over there to your cell behavior. It's, it's screwing things up. Now, if we, if we give mice with NASH five weeks of this, um, we just give them treatments every week. Um, we could probably do it twice a week, but this study was was once a week back when we were exploring um, dosing strategies. You can see that you actually get a reduction in um, in the NAFLD activity score. Now, for those of you who don't follow NASH and NAFLD as as um, as conditions, this is actually sort of one of the more important measures of um, you get a pathologist, and the pathologist looks at your uh, at slices of the liver or slices of a liver biopsy and says, well, this has characteristics, A, B, and C, horrible um, blobs of cholesterol. It has fibrosis branching between blood vessels. It has, you know, signs of inflammation. Um, the hepatocytes are getting huge. And then you get a score based on that. And this is generally what's used in uh, clinical trials. It's what's at the top of the list of things you care about. Um, so we reduce this. Um, we reduce the amount of fat in the liver. We reduce the amount of triglycerides. So this is this is all good stuff. The thing that that um, the FDA and most other people care about in Nash is not that per se. I mean, if you have it's the fibrosis because the fibrosis is the irreversible part. Everything else you can get rid of by just dieting, just quote unquote dieting, um, the dramatically dieting if you have enough fat to have Nash. We reduce fibrosis staging like quite meaningfully. And in five weeks, this is a very large effect, um, certainly bigger than anything anybody else can do at this point. So we reduce the inflammation, we reduce the fibros fibrosis signs significantly just by getting rid of the excess free cholesterol in cells. It's, very, uh, it's a very good demonstration, again, this, this fire, that the cholesterol is the important driving mechanism of pathology. And, you know, while we see this in, in the liver in NASH, again, think about your blood vessels and think about the similar um, toxicity to cells that is going on there. So after all those graphs, here's a picture. Um, so 
the Masson's trichrome stain is is one of the things we use to assess um, assess fibrosis in the liver, and it's a very colorful stain. And the fibrosis actually appears in blue in these pictures, and you can see that the fibrosis is much more prevalent. the The blobs, the white blobs here, are you know they're they're ballooned hepatocytes because in this stain, all the fat just gets drained out of the um, of the tissue when you're doing this. So the white areas are like basically fat, um, a deposition of fat, and there's a blood vessel in the top right-hand side there. But you can see that the bright blue is very prevalent in the control. This is fibrosis, excess deposition of, of collagen that disrupts tissue structure and it disrupts the function of the tissue. And, you know, we get rid of that. And this is, this is great. This is exactly what you want to do in, um, in a condition like this. So... There is a company out there, Magical Pharmaceuticals, that has a $5 billion market cap. It's a single drug company. They have a small molecule that, um, that very, very slowly tinkers um, with, with the metabolism of cholesterol. Um, and their clinical trial ran for a year, and they got something like a 10% extra reduction in fibrosis over the placebo group. And um, they've consistently, through their work, um, really addressed the low fibrosis groups. Their, their clinical trial used um, patients without much fibrosis, and their mouse trials produced very little fibrosis in comparison to you know what the standard is. And they did this because their drug is not very effective at reducing fibrosis. It does it a little bit. Nonetheless, $5.1 billion, because nobody else is anywhere near getting a drug that can actually reduce the fibrosis because the problem is the free cholesterol toxicity. So this is this is an example of why indirect methods are just not not that great. Um, you just really can't get an indirect sort of mechanism that's going to really aggressively get rid of the free the free cholesterol. You need something like what we're doing to actually use gene therapies and proteins and more sophisticated mechanisms because you know the best minds in the industry have done this. They can't do better than this because small molecules are inherently limited in what they can do to cholesterol metabolism. It's an unfortunate fact of life, and it's something that has to change now that we're in the era of, um, of gene therapies. So, onwards. Um, if you want to look at the, you know, these slides will be out there for you to look at later. If you want to take a look at the mouse data and just do mouse-to-mouse -mouse comparisons between us and, and these guys, they actually try, when they try eight weeks of treatment in mice, um, it has basically zero effect on fibrosis. And this is one of the reasons why from their early mouse studies, they, they went on to end up with, you know, year long human clinical trials is because their, their drug really just does not do much to fibrosis. We can do in five weeks, we can do what their human clinical trial does in a year. Um, and more so, uh, more directly. So it, this is why you have to, this is why at the end of the day, it's really, really important to know what your mechanism is and target that mechanism directly rather than just, you know, um, doing, doing unbiased drug searches and going with whatever seems to work. Because that leads to marginal therapies, whereas knowing what your mechanism is and targeting it directly leads to good therapies. But enough on Nash. Um, and none of you are likely to get it, I hope because you're all going to avoid obesity. Atherosclerosis, on the other hand, hard to avoid. Um, this one is 25 to 40% of humanity's mortality reason. Um, the 25% is, is the direct cause, i.e. one of your blood vessels gets blocked or ruptures. And the other 15% is, you know, how much does the narrowing of your blood vessels contribute to dementia, or heart failure, all the rest of it. Um, things that still still kill people. The problem here is with the present industry, which is targeting blood cholesterol, is that it's not blood cholesterol that kills you. It's the plaque. Um, so the plaque, the amount of plaque you have is linearly, you know, linearly correlated with your mortality risk. Four times the plaque, four times the mortality risk. So the problem here is the plaque. You've got to get rid of that. If you can get rid of the plaque, you don't care where your blood cholesterol is, because the only thing that high blood cholesterol does to a human being, aside from if you have enough of it, you're going to get deposits in your skin, which are unsightly, and that's about it. The only thing that high blood cholesterol does to a human is it kills you through atherosclerosis. So 
if you can get rid of the plaques, if you can periodically reverse them, you know, it doesn't matter what your blood cholesterol is to a first approximation. It could be 10 times human normal and you'd be okay. Now, you've seen, most of you have seen this graph, I think, by now. This is one of our early studies, but of course, I have to mention it. Um, if you look between left and right, control and treated on the left, these are cross sections of the aortic root in mice. And they're stained for lipids. So oil red O staining um, stains the lipids in these mice. These were given a, um, a gene therapy, a one-time gene therapy, AV, strong expression in the liver and throughout the body. And you see that there's quite dramatic reversal of, um, of plaque lipids in the treated mice versus the control mice, setting aside the fact, yes, there's quite a lot of variability in mouse to mouse. So this is about a 50% reduction. This is a very large effect. And one would say that this is, you know, also a 50% reduction in mortality, most likely. It's a, um, it's a really interesting experiment. Now, going forward here, how are we going to do this? Because you can't take AAV to the clinic, I should say. We have AAV results for, um, for NASH too, but you can't take AAV to the clinic, particularly for liver diseases, but really for anything, because um, it has a very high cost. There have been human deaths from high dose intravenously delivered AAV therapies and the FDA and investors are kind of nervous about this. Not to mention the fact that a large number of humans have pre-existing antibodies to some of the common AAVs. Um, certainly there, there are paths to the future for a world in which AAV recaptures its, its, um, its premier position as, as a mode of gene therapy, but we're not there yet. Current technologies are just not good enough and they're too expensive. So we are doing two things. Firstly, since we're already working on a lipid nanoparticle delivered mRNA, um, we're also talking to our partners to say, hey, can we do this for um, atherosclerosis and get something that goes more to the vasculature than to the liver? And the answer is maybe. Um, the real challenge here is that um, you may or may not know the lipid nanoparticle, most lipid nanoparticles require APOE and LDL, LDLR genes. And APOE and LDLR are are disabled in the most common mouse models of atherosclerosis, but importantly, in human um, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia and heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, those guys lack the, um, the LDLR gene, and some of them have a disabled APOE, APOE gene as well, or instead. So you, you want a lipid nanoparticle that kind of doesn't behave like the normal lipid nanoparticles, and some of those exist. Um, they're not as well developed. But we're going to be going into a second round of testing. We discovered um, at least one really interesting lipid nanoparticle in the course of 2022. Unfortunately, it's a little um, it's a little flaky to take forward. It's not ready for the clinic yet. It's not stable enough. The um, stability is a really big concern for lipid nanoparticles. If you want to, when you encapsulate um, your mRNA into the lipid nanoparticle, you want it to be good for like you know a good period of time, like at least a few days. This one, this one, we found it, it doesn't, doesn't last for more than a few hours, um, which is okay for mouse studies. And in fact, it's a really great nanoparticle from other points of view, but you can't, you just can't take that forward into the clinic. So in parallel to that, and something we've talked about in the past, we are also taking a cell therapy approach. So if you can make cells based on universal cell lines that can be introduced into any patient and then engineer those cells to have our genes and then create macrophages from those cells by differentiating them, then you have an off-the-shelf set of, of cells that you can just inject into patients, and those macrophage cells will home to areas of damage in the vasculature and just dive in and start fixing things. And um, that, is, that is a strong hope. And uh, whichever of these approaches gets to the finish line first, where the finish line is really great mouse data, then that's the one we're going to the clinic with. Um, it's important to have options. So what can I say about what I've said here? I think, firstly, one of the things that emerges from our work is that if you have a very selective therapy, you get very definitive answers. If your therapy does only one thing, then you get a very definitive answer as to whether that one thing is actually the important mechanism in, um, in, the, in the diseases you're studying. And I think this is this is an important consideration in most ways of um, dealing with dealing with aging, and it's something that's a problem when you have small molecules that are discovered through unbiased searching. It's not always clear what those small molecules are actually doing, uh, or why. 
And also effects on mechanisms tend to be fairly indirect, mostly. Um, the changing metabolism in, in a variety of different ways. So if you have the ability to very carefully, let's say with a gene therapy, do just one thing and just very carefully do that one thing, then you understand fully as to whether or not your therapy is actually good, your therapeutic approach is good. And here, the data I've shown you is an example of demonstrating that yes, actually excess free cholesterol is the problem. And the fact that we've been doing very poorly um, in these, in these um in treating atherosclerosis and nash in the past we the research community is because that the wrong mechanisms were being targeted or the right mechanisms were being targeted in bad ways indirect exceedingly indirect indirectly so if you take away anything from here cholesterol it's that cholesterol isn't just vital to life and great it's also a major problem and um it does need to be defeated and it can be defeated and uh, I think we show that this is the path that needs to be taken. And for me, success in the path of repair biotechnologies is not just, you know, getting this thing into the clinic and, and proving that we're right. It's that in doing so, we will spur the creation of an, of an industry where every big pharma company with a cardiovascular program or a metabolic program is pursuing ways to work around our patents and um, do better and and license something from us and uh, improve it, something along these lines where everybody is pursuing one of these pathways and uh, we'll be fat and happy with our, um, our, our investors as a result at the end of the day. And hopefully we also get to the point where the 20 to 30 million people who are going to die within a year or two from atherosclerosis don't die because there are an industry of large entities doing something about that using this technology or variants thereof to target the real call the real important root of the problem which is cholesterol the thing that needs to be defeated and what are we doing um in the near future so we're going to the clinic um on some time scale in the next few years we very recently submitted our first interact meeting request to the fda for our nash treatment and, you know, this is warming people up. If you have a first-in-class therapy that's doing something completely different from what's being done in the past, you kind of need to warm up the FDA, get them, get them on your side, explain which direction up is. And um, that is a process of starting underway. We're planning to do a pre-IND in late, late this year. And after that, we will raise an enormous amount of money to go do a clinical trial, perhaps in 2025. And of course, you know, it should go without saying that we're raising right now. There's a bridge round going on. We have a couple of million committed and um, are looking for other investors. So with that said, I'm happy to take questions. Um, if anybody wants to know further any of the, about anything of what we're doing here, um, happy to happy to answer them. So how about I I take a look at the um, take a look at what's in the chat here. Um, Wonderful. Thank you. Sharing. Um, we have a bunch of questions already here lined up. This is really, really great. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll just go through them and people will unmute and then maybe you can answer them directly. Steve Fawkes, you're first. Uh, yes. My first question was about what role does cholesterol oxides, do cholesterol oxides play in the cholesterol regulation pathways that you described? Um, so yeah, they, what ways are they similar and what ways are they different than cholesterol itself? So the altered cholesterols do not appear to be to be vital. Um, one should always be aware of saying that, of course, because evolution loves to promiscuously reuse things, but um, they appear to be generically a problem and we'd be fine if we didn't have them, which was the insight that sort of led cyclarity to the um, to targeting seven keto cholesterol because we should it's just outright toxic. Um, it has no, no normal function. The, the oxidized versions of LDL and oxidized cholesterols are taken up through different, different pathways than normal cholesterol into e.g. macrophages. Um, I know my CSO, his take on the, his take on why oxidized LDL and oxidized cholesterol are bad is because they let a macrophage or similar cell ingest more cholesterol than is good for it. Um, if it was only ingesting cholesterol, it would ingest, you know, N cholesterol. If there's a whole bunch of oxidized cholesterol hanging around, it can ingest 2N cholesterol and get to the point of just being being pathological and, and dead. 
Um, and that's really the role of these things. So far as I know, they're not, they're not useful in any way, potentially signaling wise. Um, one should assume that perhaps there's something going on there, but so far as I, so far as I'm aware, and from my perspective, these things are just plain toxic. Um, as you can see, yes, the, the, there are receptors that are, that take up, you know, take up these, these, uh, oxidized altered cholesterols. So in terms of next question down there from Steve Fawkes was what portion of blood cholesterol, plaque cholesterol is from the adjacent blood vessel tissue versus invading white blood cells. And I think that's a hard, that's a hard question to answer. Um, we just know that, um, if you reduce blood cholesterol to next to nothing, plaques continue to grow so in the normal environment, the higher your blood cholesterol, the faster it goes, but in, a, in an advanced case of atherosclerosis. When you're looking at a 20% mortality reduction from use of statins, then it seems that, that the fraction of the issue that is blood cholesterol at that point is smaller than the fraction of the issue that is due to other mechanisms of plaque growth and instability. So again, indirect evidence, but um, that's about the best we can say for that, that, um, that thing. So Cosmo was asking what the green fluorescent label used there. It's, it's called NBD cholesterol, uh, and you can go look that up. It's, um, you can just buy it from, um, from sellers of labeled cholesterol. I think like Thermo, Thermo will just sell it to you. Um, so it's no particular, nothing particularly special. It's just a normal, normal, commonly used fluorescently marked cholesterol. So Liz? So is somebody saying something? Is it my turn? Yeah. Uh, listen, this actually uh, really hits home because someone close to me was recently diagnosed with fatty liver disease, which is actually pretty shocking because uh, our family is vegetarian. And I had two questions. I mean, not that that actually is, you know, I mean, you can eat a terrible vegetarian diet, but I, I consider us pretty conscious. So have you looked at genes associated with uh, increased risk of this disease and uh, the outcome of your therapy in that case? The second thing is, is sugar actually uh, driving or is it mostly fats? And then my third question is, have you looked into the redosing of the lipid nanoparticles and the insult to the liver? So in reverse order, roughly, the, the redosing, this is something we're very... Um, we're very interested in the details of. Our partners have done a lot of work on this. Their des the destination for the lipid nanoparticle mRNA industry is redosing. The the setting aside some setting aside some of the work where people are trying to do single dose lipid nanoparticle RNA therapies like Verve. Um, the industry is really heading in the direction of we want this to be just like small molecules um, and produce lipid nanoparticles where the redosing is very well understood and mRNA strategies where redosing is very well understood. So this is, this is the future. Certainly not everybody is, um, is, is fully on board with having a lot of data on that, but the, um, there are lipid nanoparticles out there that are being used um, for redosing um, in trials or otherwise approved medicines. So there's a lot of information out there. If you talk to the people who are, um, further along in, in doing that. Genovant is a good company to talk to about redosing because their work tends to focus on that in one, one quarter of what they're doing. So sugar versus fats. Um, I, I don't like to comment on dietary stuff because it's all so, it's all clearly so dependent on your gut microbiome and, and the data is all over the map and it seems to be impossible to find good studies out there. It just seems to be eat sensible. Is, is the way to go. And in terms of genetic susceptibility to NASH and NAFLD, and by the way, if you have NAFLD, just stop eating um, and it'll go away. So as long as you don't have the fibrosis, you're, you're reversible. The, the, the gene susceptibility thing is not something that we focus on at all um, because what we're doing is providing an entirely new capability of cells to get rid of the cholesterol. It really doesn't matter what type of cell we put it into. It does the same thing. Um, and this fits well with my thesis that personalized medicine is a bit of a, um, a bit of a not great sidebar 
um, and that really good therapies are fairly independent of genotype. As in, you will get much the same, we all age for much the same reason. And if you go treat a cause of pathology that is really a significant cause of pathology, then you don't really have to worry that much about um, about differences between between people, uh, or perhaps not even differences between genders, which are somewhat pronounced for lipid metabolism, fat storage, all the rest of it. Um, but if you if you're really just targeting the thing that causes cells to be upset, then hopefully you you don't have to care too much about um, about differences between people. So. Uh, onward. Again with another one. I think uh, Cosmos has second question here was what was the product of the enzymatic reaction? Um, and that I can't tell you, um, because patents and we like to keep a low profile on this thing. That one's a little, that one's behind the, um, behind the NDA for talking to investors and potential partners. I apologize for that. Completely classified. Well, what about, um, what about the substrates? Are you targeting just all cholesterol, all, all yes. sterol, all, all cholesterols? So any modification of cholesterol, it's fair game. It will get broken down. And 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 I, I didn't quite catch the name of the fluorescent label. Was the cholesterol bodipi? It was no. This is N N D B cholesterol. N D B. Gotcha. It's uh, an abbreviation for something or other. So Steve Fox wanted a clarification of fibrosis to to collagen. So. Fibrosis is roughly excess deposition of extracellular matrix, and most of that is going to be collagen. Um, so perhaps it would be more accurate to say excess deposition of scar-like extracellular matrix in fibrils that disrupts tissue structure. So um, I answered Liz on the repetitive dosing. Um, we have tested we of course are some of the data I showed you was um, was was done with weekly dosing for five or more weeks. Um, and Steve Fox asked, "What tech or future tech can be brought to bear in quantifying localized cholesterol?" So yeah, that's an interesting question. So obviously you can completely quantify it if you can cut the piece of the tissue out and um, and and go do the normal um, the normal kits on it. So. I, Equally obviously, that's that's probably not a good thing for, let's say, cerebral arteries or um, or you know other things that you like to keep inside your body rather than outside your body. Um, so, if somebody could come up with a with with something something ultrasound or uh, or or some other way of like do of of processing imaging data to get a good take on what sorts of cholesterol in there i'm not up on up on that side of the house well enough to know whether that's actually a feasible a feasible approach can you distinguish if you could distinguish between free cholesterol inside cells and esterified cholesterol inside cells that would be a starting point but it's not clear to me that you could do that. but nonetheless um I, I guarantee that if we get to the point where big pharma entities are saying hum we should be getting rid of excess free cholesterol then these technologies will emerge because people will want ways to assess without cutting pieces of their body out. Um, that seems to be a strong desire amongst humanity. Reasonable. We have Larry with a question who had his head up. Go ahead. Yeah, it takes me a couple of seconds on me, but it's really interesting reason. I, I think it's a, a really interesting approach. Um, I, I was just wondering, I mean, one of the problems with lipid nanoparticles, at least the current cationic stuff they do is that they seem to get into every cell you know, or, or seeing that at least, you know, that's what the thought is now. And and I, I was just wondering, you know, using traditional liposomes, right. You know, played around a little bit with them a long time ago, you couldn't help, but get them into the liver and in the cupfer cells and you, you know, and, and whether, you know, that's a thought too, instead of using, you know, lipid nanoparticles, just go with a more traditional liposome and, and, um, and, you know, just targeting Nash, I think is more than sufficient, uh, um, uh, to you, you know, to to do something, yeah, yeah. It's definitely one of the challenges there. Is if you go do that, then you're going to be you're going to look bad to the FDA, who are expecting you to come in with something that has a much lower, a much lower, you know, ability to stress cells um, and or cause cause issues. And you want to dose higher um, than maybe you can with the older approaches for this sort of technology. 
the, the, the state of the art right now has moved on considerably and lipid nanoparticles are now able to be targeted to, um, I mean, Thermo Fisher has, um, has the, uh, the in vivo effectamine team over there that has targeted nanoparticles that go, you know, 99% to the muscle or 99% to the lung or 99% to the liver or 99% to the pancreas, you know, this sort of stuff. And analogously, many of the developers are similarly, similarly has quite, um, have quite uh, well developed, um, the bin nanoparticle targeting there are, and that's setting aside putting ligands on these things to get yeah, them. The, yeah. That's more. the approach is, yeah, it's, it's a more expensive approach too, cause you're, you're targeting, you know, with, you know, other antibodies or, or other, other stuff that break it to places and, um, yeah. yeah. Expensive is reluctantly the way things go in this industry. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately. Yeah. So, yeah. At the end, of, the end of the day, we've seen that we've seen the cost for, for mass manufacture of, of the lipid nanoparticle yeah. and an MRNA. And it's not that bad. I mean, at the end of the day, mass manufacture, you're looking at, um, you're looking at very reasonable cost of goods to the point at which it's going to be entirely the indication and the choice of the farmer who markets this as to what the price is going to be. It can be quite low. So, um, other questions, uh, Jason C. Um, so there's after the final gene therapy, how would the upregulated protein production differentiate between damaging amounts of cholesterol versus positive amounts of cholesterol? Well, the main end goal is to remove plaque and the way in which our therapy works exactly, I can't really talk about, um, for the same reason, I can't tell you what it breaks down things into, um, without an NDA, but it does distinguish between excess cholesterol and cholesterol that is necessary to cell function. You have to force things quite a long way in order to get it to start to eat cholesterol. Uh, you have to really create very artificial circumstances in a cell culture dish to get it to the point where our, our fusion protein hurts cells because it's somehow getting rid of cholesterol that the cell needed. Um, it's very hard to do that. So it, it distinguishes quite accurately. Um, between cell, between damaging cholesterol and cholesterol is necessary. Um, and one minute, the public, three minutes, two minutes. What are we on? Um, um, well, I don't, you you. I don't want to let you go. I don't want to let you go. Reason before you explaining us that if people get excited about work, what can they do to help support you? Um, introduce us to to friendly investors and or throw money at us. I, I say this every time. But um, it's it's so true. Well, it's good to have it as the final piece. Um, this was a very full house seminar. I think one of the fullest ones that we've had. Uh, Brian Johnson was also really well attended, but uh, interest is certainly there. Uh, it was really, really great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, I hope to see you back at the next one very soon. And thank you, Reason, for all your work and uh, for continuing to keep on pushing. Thank You're you. welcome. It's a pleasure. Thanks all. Bye, guys.